If a friend asked you how they could be right with God, what would you say? How would you describe salvation to them? John MacArthur helps make sure that you're ready with an answer, a biblical answer. That's coming next on today's Grace to You. You know, your life won't change uh, dramatically if you misjudge the weather forecast or you're wrong about a loved one's birthday. But there is one question that you must answer correctly. You can't afford to get it wrong. What's the question? Well, simply put, who can be right with God? By the way, that's the title of the brand new series that John MacArthur is presenting on today's Grace to You. Before we get to the lesson, John, I know uh, the Grace to You staff recently returned from their holiday break and What was waiting at the office? Well, I'll just say it was a good thing, a really good thing. Uh, Talk about that for a minute. Yeah, I wondered where they all went. So they had a holiday, huh? Well, we give them that once in a while, around the end of the year. (laughs) And we're glad to do that. They work hard all the year long. But when they come back... Uh, they, they come back to, uh, to a mail room that looks like it was uh, operated by a hoarder because there are piles and piles and piles. That's a good thing, but there's just mail everywhere. And then it becomes this uh, explosion of joy and blessing as letters are opened and every one of them read and, um, and we hear all the wonderful testimonies of what Grace to You has meant. This is so encouraging to our wonderful staff. And then, of course, uh, those letters have gifts to the ministry. Um, I I have to believe that whatever celebration goes on at Christmas is certainly a wonderful thing, but but it it is sustained right through the first part of January because that is a celebration for this ministry to see how God has provided. And this year was no different. The outpouring so far— has been very sacrificial and humbling to us. Listeners uh, hearing our radio broadcasts, accessing sermons uh, free of charge online, receiving tens of thousands of free resources, um, responding in the way that that you all do uh, bring great joy to us. By all measures, really, we're ending the year on a great note and starting 2015 on strong footing. So very, very grateful. Thank you all. Now, friend, thank you for the many ways that you support Grace to You. Uh, We thank you for your prayers, feedback, and for giving as you're able. Your partnership is vital in helping us take God's Word around the world. Now, let's get to today's lesson, and here's John MacArthur once again to open the Word of God, continuing his series, showing you who can be right with God. Turn to Luke chapter 18 and look at verses 9 through 14. Luke chapter 18, verses 9 through 14. As is true of so many of our Lord's stories, they are counterintuitive. But not just counterintuitive, really outrageous, shameful by all existing religious standards. And this is one that fits into the category of an outrageous and shameful story. For in this story, Jesus describes the unrighteous man as the one who was right with God and the righteous man as the one who was not. How is one made right with God? How is one reconciled to God? That is the big, big question. And that is the question our Lord answers in this simple story. How? Can a person be right with God? That's the most compelling question. And this simple story, isn't it amazing? Simple story, verses 10 through 14, answers that question with amazing profundity, simplicity, and clarity. And you might think that that kind of a question could lead to the most convoluted, complex, massive discussion of theology and religion ever. No, it's not complicated. It's not complex. It's just this simple. You want to know how simple it is? Here's how simple it is. Either you can make yourself right before God or you can't. Is that simple enough? There are no more options than that. Powerful story. Two men, two postures, two prayers, two results, 
Now we're going to break it down. Point number one, the comprehensive audience. Now, his audience is certain ones, certain ones, literally whoever the ones in the Greek, whoever the ones, very, very broad, anybody and everybody who trusted in themselves that they were righteous. Sermon on the Mount, Jesus at the beginning of that sermon says this, Matthew 5.20, unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. You won't be in it spiritually, you won't be in it millennially, and you won't be in it eternally either unless you have a righteousness that exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees. Nobody could comprehend that. What are you talking about? They were the personification of human righteousness. How could anybody surpass that? It was the 16th century, and it was Germany, and there was a monk named Martin Luther. He sat in the tower of the black cloister, called that because they wore black. Wittenberg, meditating on the perfect righteousness of God. He was the most scrupulous of monks. When you read the biographies of Luther, it is amazing how scrupulous he was. Attention to detail in his life. He confessed his sins multiple hours per day. He sought forgiveness for the minutest of sins. He realized, however, that with all this effort, as he looked at the standard of perfect righteousness, it was utterly and absolutely unattainable because he knew his own heart. In fact, he concluded that divine righteousness is unrelenting, unforgiving, avenging. It is a kind of wrath. He believed his state was hopeless. He had been told as a child that God is full of vengeance, that Jesus sits on a rainbow pouring out vengeance, and the only hope you'll ever have to be saved is to go to Mary. And when he understood that the righteousness of God was perfection and that that's what God required, it made him angry. This is what he said, the expression, the righteousness of God was like a thunderbolt in my heart. I hated Paul with all my heart. He hated Paul because Paul wrote in Romans about the righteousness of God. Only, he said, when I read these words, the just shall live by faith, only then did I find relief. And he was helped by reading Augustine, when I learned that the righteousness of God